The Middletown Township Historical Society is pleased to welcome back one of our all-time best presenters, Dr. Richard Veit. He is engaging, entertaining, and educational, and I'm going to briefly tell you uh, why. If you haven't seen his uh, talk on Point Breeze in Middletown, you'll be amazed to learn that there was a Bonaparte in New Jersey and what he built and what happened to his estate. The next time it's presented, uh, try to uh, uh, catch it. If you haven't seen his talk on terracotta, you might never realize what a, a flexible and surprising building material um, uh, uh, this uh, was. And if you haven't heard his talk on the cemeteries, your prior knowledge of funerary practice could be, well, dead wrong. But there you don't have to wait for a uh, talk. You can uh, get his book, New Jersey Cemeteries and Tombstones, one of a long list of uh, publications uh, Dr. Veit has authored or uh, co-authored. Um, uh, He's a professor in the Department of History and Anthropology at Monmouth University. He has a long record of distinguished service and has held many posts there, capped recently by being uh, named Provo and the Senior Vice President of Academic uh, uh, Affairs. Uh, he, outside the classroom, he has done many revealing archeological digs, and tonight we're going to hear one close to home the 1828 lighthouse at uh, Twin Lights that was built in what was Middletown Township at the time. Rich, please take the floor. Rich, thanks. All right, that was, that was the finest introduction ever. I will now have to live up to it. Uh, oh my, oh my goodness. Well, thank you. It's very, very kind. So uh, let's hope the technology gods smile on us. And uh, the font is a little funny. Tom and I were working on that. The computer has taken over. So it looks like, you know, sort of 1920s typewriter stuff. But the presentation I'm going to give you this evening is titled, The Lighthouses Were Also Much Out of Repairs. It's from uh, an inspector's visit to the Twin Lights. And the inspector found a lot of problems both with the lighthouse keeper's house and with the lighthouses themselves. And we also called this renewed archaeological investigations at the Twin Lights of the Navasink. And you'll see why they're renewed in just a minute. And this is very much a team effort. I mean, I have the honor of being the presenter this evening, and I'm really glad to be here with all of you in a, a really stunning Middletown Public Library. This is quite, uh, quite a place you have here. But this project was done by three individuals, not to count uh, about two dozen students who participated. So Matt Kalos from Brookdale Community College and his students worked with us, and then Adam Heinrich and I both teach at Monmouth University, and we're we're kind of uh, perpetual partners. Uh, I don't want to say in crime, but in archaeology. So with that said, let's go visit the lighthouse. Um, the entrance to New York Harbor is one of the more challenging entrances to a major harbor in North America. It's impeded by sandbars and shifting shoals and has been challenging since European navigators first traversed the coast in the 17th century. Um, the map on the left, and it gives you an idea. You can see Sandy. Let me see if the pointer. There's the Sandy Hook Peninsula. Twin Lights is down here. And this is the modern channel into the harbor, though, of course, that's been dredged and improved over the years. Here's Staten Island. Manhattan. And this is a 19th century painting. I, I just thought it was a wonderful folk art painting of ships coming into the harbor. So how to protect and how to guide ships into that harbor so that you don't have this problem. And this is a wonderful map that shows some of the many shipwrecks along the Jersey coast. Um, one source I read said it if you laid these end to end, you could literally walk uh, from Cape May to Sandy Hook on the bones of wrecked ships. And I know Tyler Bain, who's here in the audience, has done some good work researching just some of these shipwrecks. 
So as early as the 1600s, there were efforts to better mark the channel and to guide ships into New York Harbor. This is a wonderful map from the Monmouth County Historical Association. It's part of a collection of papers associated with the Hartshorn family. You may be familiar with Hartshorn Woods uh, Park, not very far away. The Hartshorns were among the first European settlers in this area in the late 1600s. They owned a tremendous amount of land. I mean, what you're looking at here is in part Middletown, Highlands and Atlantic Highlands, Sandy Hook is stretching up this way. Sandy Hook is sometimes connected to the mainland and sometimes it's separated during this time period. But what I would have you take in right above William Hartshorn's land within the fence, 812 acres, is unfortunately it's upside down, but the beacon. We think this map is from about 1711. And there's evidence that a beacon was erected on the highlands of Navasink to help mariners orient themselves and also there was a secondary purpose and apparently that was that if pirates were sighted offshore the beacon should be lit and people in new york this predates sandy hook lighthouse right people in new york in manhattan would be able to see it and know that trouble was coming their way i found a wonderful account by uh governor hamilton from the, i think it was the 1740s of new jersey who said that there were pirates, the beacon was lit, and no one noticed. Uh, so ultimately, it was unsuccessful. More famous, of course, is the Sandy Hook Lighthouse, constructed in the 1760s by New York merchants who ran a pair of lotteries to raise money for it. So imagine the Powerball raising money for a lighthouse today. Uh, Monmouth got to do a number of projects out on Sandy Hook one was looking for earlier lighthouse keepers dwellings like this. If you go out there now, right, there's a very nice lighthouse keepers dwelling as her museum gift shop. Uh, but there were earlier structures. We were looking for those. And we were also looking for what well, you may have heard of the refugee town. So during the American Revolution, uh, loyalists and especially African-Americans fled to the hook where they had the protection of the British Army and British troops and then raided back into Monmouth County. We found some artifacts associated with that Revolutionary War occupation right around the base of the lighthouse. The lighthouse also had a problem with what you might call ring around a collar uh, that the National Park Service was trying to correct. It sort of, it acts like a wick and sort of soaks up water. So it had like this dirty line about three quarters of the way up and they had painted it and it kept coming back. So they were trying to fix that by improving conditions around the foundation. The Sandy Hook Lighthouse is essentially at sea level, so it's a good lighthouse, but there was still need to improve conditions uh, around the entrance to New York Harbor. So in the 1820s, and this is a letter, and I know it's bad form with a PowerPoint to put a lot of text up on screen, so I apologize, but this is a letter from 1827 that basically talks about how these two lighthouses should be built. And they want two lighthouses up there uh, because they want it to be distinct from the Sandy Hook Light. They don't want anyone to see it and sort of mix up where they are and run aground. They're having actually all sorts of problems with that already. There are a number of other dual lighthouses or paired lighthouses in the United States, and there was even a, a trifecta up in, up in New England. So here's what they say. The lighthouse is to be built as follows, to be of the octagonal form, to be built of good blue split stone and the best quick lime and sand mortar. Um, you may have had trouble with contractors they will have trouble with contractors. The foundation to be five feet thick from the base to the water table, four feet thick on top of the water table and graduated to two feet, six, two feet six inches thick at the top of the pyramid. The height of the building to be 40 feet above the water table to the deck of the lantern, 24 feet, six inches diameter. I mean, it has a lot, a lot of detail. It's supposed to be six feet below surface. Okay, uh, a substantial door, how wide everything is. There's paving. It sounds great, right? I mean, there it is all laid out. How could you make any mistakes? Um, so that comes out in 1827. Construction is really 1827 into 1828. By 1829, the lighthouse and keeper's house are completed. This is one of our earliest depictions of the lighthouses. Uh, this is from 1845. So they're 
They're almost two decades old uh, at this point, and it shows the two lighthouses, a keeper's dwelling, uh, a tavern down on the waterfront, and a marine semaphore up here that would have allowed signals to be sent when they see ships coming into harbor to signal back to merchants in New York. Also notice, right, bars, landing is missing. All the familiar sites are missing from this map. It's pretty sparsely populated during this time period. Okay, so 1828 is the construction. This is the next year. Samuel Sportwout is collector at the New York Customs House, and this is his report. They basically have yearly reports. I promise you I will not read all of them to you, but some of them are, are just great. Mr. Joseph Doty, who knew nothing about lighthouses. He was from Bridgewater, New Jersey. He was a farmer and well-connected politically, and that got him appointed with a great job, lighthouse keeper. Keeper of the lighthouse at the Highlands of Neversink came to this office to report to me that the clockwork of its lighthouse was so much out of order that it was necessary to turn it by hand. So imagine, right, they have this lens that's going to move up there. Initially, it's a whole series of lamps, and they do it kind of like you might run an old-fashioned grandfather clock, where weights fall, and that turns the whole mechanism. But the whole thing has gone askew, and he is looking for help, right? He has to turn it by hand. He and his family are worn out by the labor of attending it at night. I asked Mr. Rogers to visit the light, inspect the clock. You will perceive that the work is good for nothing and cannot be repaired. It's a year old, right? And it's not working. Um, I don't know that they had a lemon law for lighthouses. Here is another painting. There are a pair of paintings like this. This one is on display uh, at Twin Lights State Historic Site. Again, you can see the two lighthouses, octagonal, ships in the distance, the marine semaphore, the lighthouse keeper's house, people engaged in romantic activities and tourism. One of the uh, really fun things is my colleague Adam Heinrich uh, stumbled on uh, a lot of information about early tourism, that this was a place to go. Uh, in the early 1800s and continued to be, well, continues to be today. And that was sort of fun because we don't think of tourists during this time period. By the 1840s, there's some new technologies coming out and they're going to directly affect how the lighthouse runs, especially something called Fresnel or Fresnel lens, which is invented in France uh, by a physicist and it allows light to be focused in this amazing beam that can shine out miles into the ocean. It's incredibly bright. Um, and this is from Samuel Pleasanton, who's running the light uh, life-saving service during this time period in his letter. You've suggested the propriety of putting up the two sets of lenses, one revolving, this one, and the other fixed at the two never sink lighthouses. And these happen to be the only lighthouses in the United States of America sufficient to admit the lenses. The backstory here is this lens comes out, this new lens, super excited about it because before that they're using like whale oil and wicks and it's smoky and mirrors and it's just a mess. Uh, so this seems like a great innovation. And Matthew Perry, who's a United States Navy Commodore, famous for opening Japan, first United States uh, naval officer into Japan, is dispatched to France to bring back the lenses. But, and there's always a but, but they forgot to measure. The initial thought was they would put the lens, the revolving lens you see here, in the Sandy Hook Lighthouse. They get it back with a French engineer in tow and they go up in the Sandy Hook Lighthouse and they measure the top and they say, oh, this is awkward. It won't fit. Uh, and then they start looking for other places. And it turns out uh, Twin Lights is the best place. Uh, and this is a critical thing. The diameter of the top of each tower is 16 feet larger by several feet than any of our any other of our lighthouses. So we concur that it's the right place to put them. Here we are about the same time period, the 1840s. Notice a lot is going on. Their roads, these are even more complicated than the current road up to Twin Lights, which is a narrow, complicated road. I'm sure you've driven up it. There are now a number of lighthouse keepers houses up here because the people who are working there were just overwhelmed by trying to take care of these two lights. So they're constantly lobbying their uh, government officials for help. And we get we get a whole set of folks up here. We still have a semaphore 
Uh, and now we have a series of hotels down along the waterfront. One of the interesting things is they have real water problems up at Twin Lights. So they try and dig a well. They get down like 120 feet. They don't hit water. So uh, then they put in a cistern. So rainwater coming off the roof of one of the lighthouse keepers dwellings puts water into that. So they've got water but it's not great water, as you can imagine, right? It's running off a roof. It's kind of gray water. And there must be a half dozen letters from the lighthouse keepers who want an ice house so that they can have cool drinks in the summertime. And this causes a lot of consternation in Washington, D.C. They're like an ice house. Who do you think you are? I mean, this is a job. You're not at some sort of spa there relaxing. That is completely unconscionable. Uh, so they go back and forth. The other problem is the lighthouse keepers themselves tend not to get along with the folks who are running the taverns at the bottom of the hill. So they're constantly, it's like neighbors who can't get along with each other. They're constantly sparring with each other. Um, 1840s, there are more problems and the problems are getting serious. This is not an old building, right? 1827, 28, it went up, 1842. Uh, Mr. Lewis goes to visit. I found the walls of the tower cracked in several places, that should be places, by the effect of frost upon the foundations. The tower stands on a steep slope with an embankment on the lower side to give additional security and strength to the foundation. The embankment checks the drainage of the rainwater from the hill and causes it to settle about the foundations of the tower. During the winter months, frost is formed. Hence the cracks in the wall. After a very close scrutiny, I could not discover that the tower had settled out of the perpendicular. We would have a leaning tower of highlands in the smallest degree. And I therefore concluded that all the repairs necessary would be to protect the foundations from the water descending the hill above by laying gutters. Sounds pretty straightforward. Uh, stone flagging under the water table. And I got a cost, $450. That sounds like a bargain to me. Uh, I just put up a fence in my backyard and it was much, much more than that. <laughs> also in the 1840s, we see some other structures constructed. So while they're working on the lighthouses, because they're seeing these cracks, they put up a third lighthouse because they're afraid that if the lighthouse collapses, either of them, they will only have one light left. And then it won't be the twin lights. Mariners coming from France and England and Italy will not know what they're looking at, will be confused, shipwreck will result. So they put up a third light. And I think that would actually be a fun project to look for that third light in, in the future. It's there for about a decade. It's the sort of thing, we're about to do something like this at Mammoth, where you're like, oh, we will do this project and it will be done in the summer and we'll be back to normal. And then like three years later, you're still living with it. So this goes on for about a decade. They also put, um, besides the Marine, the semaphore, they also have a telegraph station up there very early on. Telegraphies, you know, revolutionizes communication in the mid 19th century. It's essentially invented in uh, northern New Jersey uh, by members of the Vale family um, who sell this technology and it becomes so important in improving communication. They want a telegraph station up here because again, they can see all the ships arriving from Europe and they can send that information to New York, to Philadelphia, to Washington, D.C. Uh, things can the date on this is incorrect, but things continue to get worse. This should not be 1871, it's 1841. The keeper has no knowledge of the method by which the apparatus can be adjusted. Now we're not complaining about the building, we're complaining about the employees. Nor is there any competent person employed to perform that important service, nor is there anyone charged with the repair of the mechanical lamps and machinery. A small printed work purported to be a translation of the instruction to the light keepers in France and printed letter from the office of the fifth auditor directing the keeper to light his lights at sunset and extinguish them at sunrise and to keep a bright clear light during the night are the only guides in the possession of the keeper to the performance of his duties. So not only is the building a mess, but the people working there are really not on top of their game. And it's like they have 
you know, it's like they bought a kit from Ikea and they have the instructions, but uh, they're in some Scandinavian language that they can't read. So they decide ultimately during the American Civil War, this is rather amazing, that a new pair of lighthouses will be constructed. You would think the federal government would have other priorities during the American Civil War. And I think it shows just how important this lighthouse or these lighthouses were. We have two wonderful maps from that time period. This one is kind of current conditions. So the North Lighthouse, which is the stationary light, the South Lighthouse, where the new lighthouses will be constructed, the keeper's dwelling, which appears to be under the parking lot today, the road up, again, different than today, and then an illustration showing the new lighthouse that will be constructed there relative to the original lighthouses, and even a nice cross section up there. So great mapping courtesy of the federal government. These are in the National Archives. 1861, they start building the new lighthouse. And this is such a great illustration because here again, telegraph, marine semaphore, Sandy Hook out here, New York in the distance, the original North Light, the new North Light being constructed. And this is one of the earliest photographs that shows the lighthouses. This hillside is now largely forested, uh, and there are a number of other buildings, but it was completely open during this time period. Beautiful lighthouses, brownstone uh, quarried in uh, some of the stones from New York, some of it's from northern New Jersey. Bears a very strong resemblance to the insignia of the Army Corps of Engineers, but that may be more happenstance than intentional, but still, still wonderful. Um, here's a... Uh, like Randy, I am a collector of postcards, and there are a lot of postcards uh, of the lighthouses at Twin Lights. I love this one from about 1910, uh, because just look at all the, pardon my, like all the junk on the hillside besides the lighthouses. There is a lot going on there. And that will remain the case well into the 20th century. There are military installations, there are multiple competing telegraph companies up there, um, you name it, the radar installations. So in 1999, I got to run my first archeological project at Twin Lights. And this is uh, my wife uh, who is uh, pregnant with our son, Doug, who is now 24, which is kind of mind boggling when we were out there. And the question we were asked by the Tom Laverty, who was then the uh, park superintendent was, can you find the original lighthouses? Notice around my wife, Terry, the dead patch of grass. I felt confident saying, yes, I think we can, Tom. Um, and we started digging and there were stones underground right there. And as we dug more, uh, these are terrible, but there's slides that are, you know, 25 years old that I scanned. Um, but we had the lighthouse underground and then the way it was constructed just looked awful. I mean, it does not look well made. And the current project is going to shed a lot more information on that. This uh, 2022 uh, was asked to do another project up on Twin Lights by uh, Nick Wood. You see over here, the park superintendent, who's a very historically minded fellow. And it was for a group of historians of surveying. So these guys were, they were a lot of fun and they're really into surveying. And for me, it, you know what I love about it? It's like, there's a club for everybody, no matter what you're into. Um, and these gentlemen, this was the fellow who organized the whole thing. Uh, he had figured out that the first detailed coastal map of the United States had its starting point, its datum, right in front of these lighthouses. And he had detailed information exactly where it should be. So his question was, can we find it? And apparently it's supposed to be this ceramic cone that sits underground. Uh, so here we are digging. It's Marilyn Scherfin. She was supervising this Reagan Miller and Eric Lowenstein. And we dug right where we're supposed to be. And we found a hole. Uh, we dug a hole, but there was a hole inside our hole. Uh, it appeared that there had been a cellar of a building here. We did not find 
the Hassler cone, this datum, much to everyone's chagrin. Um, so I was surprised we got an invite to come back the next year. Um, and we were asked again by Nick to come back and he wanted us to excavate the entire base of the Southern Lighthouse. And then he wanted to leave it open as part of the park that people could come and see. You'll see it in a second. It's super cool. Uh, as it turned out, it was a little bit bigger than we expected, despite all that good information about how big it should be. And it also proved to be a little bit of a conservation headache for the folks at state parks. Once they got it, everybody was super excited. And then they were like, so how do we preserve this? And right now they've covered it back over while I figure out how to preserve it. So this is the area we focused on. Actually, you could, we were up here for the search for the Hassler cone. All right, so this is kind of finished product. We're going a little bit out of order. And it's, this is really an, a beautiful drawing uh, by Adam Heinrich. And here are some pictures. The great thing about working, looking for an old lighthouse next to a current lighthouse is you don't need to have a drone license to get good aerial photographs. You just climb up the current lighthouse and take a picture looking down. So this is what it looks like. But this took us uh, close to two months to unearth this whole thing. We didn't go very deep. We're only about a foot deep, uh, the deepest spots we went. But it was enormous. And then there's this curious feature in the center of it, like a box. And we're not sure, to be honest, is that for a support for the stairs that would have wrapped up inside the building? Maybe, but there was like, there was 20th century junk in the box. There were like Yoohoo bottles and stuff like that, that uh, are not that old. So other ideas, like maybe there was a flagpole there, uh, also come to mind. The artifacts are, are interesting and unusual. For instance, we found a lot of these. They're carbon rods. They're if you ever had those big chalk that you can use to write on a sidewalk that are about this big around, maybe that long, we had a lot of them broken, um, dozens of them. In fact, this is about se over 7,000 artifacts all told. Um, we had dozens of these. It turns out they're from one of the lamps that was used in the lighthouse. So if you've seen the movie Young Frankenstein, uh, with like bolts of electricity. This is an arc lamp. So it would have these two carbon rods and an electrical arc would jump from one to the other. It would be blinding. It would be like lightning right there. And that's why I was thinking of young Frankenstein. And apparently when they burned out, the lighthouse keepers just tossed them out of the lighthouse. So they were all over the place. So there should be another letter talking about what slobs these guys were. Um, Another interesting thing, we had all this red glass and we're like, you know, why is there stained glass here? And we believe that and this is a lighthouse in Washington state that they had these colorized panels. So you get this red and white flashing, almost like a police car uh, that would have been really visible and distinctive again for mariners. So they know they know what they're approaching. And that was not something that was well represented in the written record. So the archaeology is telling us stuff that the written documents didn't. Here's the original lighthouse. Again, the telegraph here, the replacement lighthouses, great illustrations. The other thing to take in from both of these images is tourists, right? People love to visit Twin Lights. Still true today. People we're up to, when we were working, folks were out like getting pictures taken, engagement pictures, bicycling through, taking pictures, walking their dogs. It was it was actually a lot of fun. Gene Housen, who's a local archaeologist, um, did a wonderful study where she she mapped out year by year all the different steamboats from about the second decade of the 19th century. Uh, into the 1940s that were coming to stop at the steamboat landing below the lighthouses. Essentially, this is like the circle line in New York. They're bringing people to visit. And the number of vessels, it's just, it's just mind boggling how active that traffic was. And then we got a lot of curious like personal items uh, too. So a lot of jewelry, beads, charms. Um, some archeologists have written a lot about uh, blue glass beads and how they often are actually associated with African-American sites. We had a couple of those. 
uh, we had faux coins. Um, we had fraternal organizations. Victorians loved to join organizations and they lost their pins and apparently they wore them everywhere. And then we were really excited about this sort of heart-shaped locket. We thought like maybe a love token or something. It turns out, um, turns out maybe the archeologists are romantics uh, because it's actually, uh, it's a dog stag from uh, Gainsborough uh, from the early 20th century. There's a strong military presence. So we have buttons from the Civil War time period and from the Second World War. There are radar installations up there, right? Just as there's a Battery Lewis not very far away, uh, there's real concern with protecting the approaches to New York. So that is represented in the artifacts. And uh, oh, Gustav Cope wrote a, a great guide to... Uh, the it's a guide to the different places that the Jersey Central Railroad visited. Um, and here is his description of Highland Beach nearby hammocks, lawn tennis, croquet pots, rifle shooting, archery, merry go round, scups. I'm not entirely sure what that is. And seesaws are provided at trifling costs. I mean, you want to go. Uh, we had evidence for uh gunplay uh at twin lights, shotgun shells, uh, small caliber pistol rifles, um, clay pigeons. So people are up there presumably shooting. That seems like a very unsafe thing to be doing at the lighthouse with tourists around, but uh, there's good evidence for it. And then there are modern artifacts. Is there, everybody probably knows what that is, right? For blowing, blowing bubbles, right? And marbles. Uh, a little cowboy hat. Um, these are from you know, uh, ice cream. Perhaps familiar from Polaroid cameras. Um, and then somebody lost their uh, their Boy Scout uh, or Cub Scout ring. Probably a sad. It's a sterling silver ring. That was probably a sad moment. I can imagine some upset parents, if not an upset child. So what did we learn? And this is from a movie about lighthouses. That's pretty scary. Um, we learned an awful lot about how the lighthouse was constructed and the things people did there. One thing that I should have emphasized earlier that I didn't tell you about, though, is why do they have so many problems with the lighthouse, right? They finish it, and they're almost immediately having problems. And we think that there are two two different things going on besides the water running down the hill, besides the frost action. The two other problems they have appear to be that, and I hope nobody's related to him, Mr. Charles K. Smith, I know that's kind of a generic witness protection name of Stonington, Connecticut, is the builder. And his instructions say that he's supposed to use cut bluestone, bluestone is granite, blocks that are supposed to be interlocked to build the lighthouse if we go back hold on let me see if i can go back oh no that's the wrong way oh if you look at the lighthouse the outside is beautifully cut stone blocks between those stone blocks not so much it looks like he cheated. Uh, he basically built an inside and an outside the right way, and he filled the middle with kind of whatever junk he had around. Uh, the other thing, and that really shows up in this, uh, again, this very good drawing. The other thing uh, that was interesting in some areas, he's using a lot of mortar to hold things together. Other areas have no mortar at all. And then back in 1999, when we looked at some of the mortar using a microscope, you may already know this. So you don't want to use beach sand in construction um, because the uh, sand grains are rounded. Uh, and also sometimes you have uh, salts in, in the sand. So it appears that, I mean, it would have been convenient, but he appears to have been using beach sand as well. So almost immediately his mortar starts failing and they have cracks. There's one, I didn't put one quote up, but there's one where an inspector says he could just imagine how scary this is with a building that he could run a lead pencil a full 12 inches into the side of the lighthouse. So it's like, how does this thing even stay standing? It must have, it must have been terrifying to work in it. So let me go.